One of the most important elements of any video game that features some form of narrative conclusion is often the final challenge. This can, of course, take shape in many forms, but within the JRPG genre, it has frequently manifested in the final boss. As a prominent part of this particular genre, Final Fantasy has adopted this game design element with significant gusto, and it means that ever since the first game released back in 1987, it's been difficult to find a Final Fantasy game that falls within the original genre that hasn't featured a final boss. But what's interesting is just how much the notion of the final boss has changed over the years, and in today's video, which will be the first episode of a small mini-series, we're excited to explore this particular topic in our typical granular style. As a word of warning though, and this relates to every game we will go on to cover, not just Final Fantasy XIV, due to the fact we're talking about final bosses, there is a very strong chance of spoilers throughout this video series. And as a further disclaimer, and to minimise this, when it comes to the MMOs, mobile games, and any other games like Final Fantasy XV that featured significant expansion, we will only be covering final bosses associated with the base game. So, with that in mind, we encourage you to sit back and relax as we explore the complete evolution of final bosses. Following in the footsteps of its forebears, the original Final Fantasy featured a rather interesting and iconic final boss, Chaos. From the outset, one of the key design decisions taken by the development team was that they wanted the story to have an essence of poetry about it, and it was with this in mind that they decided that the first boss should later return as the final boss. When the game shipped, this remained true as the first boss was Garland, and although it would be Chaos who would serve as the final boss in the more literal sense, Chaos was Garland. As the story reached its conclusion, Chaos was created after Garland absorbed the power of the Four Fiends. It led to him undergoing a significant metamorphic transformation, something that turned him from being human in appearance to being otherworldly. Due to this, it meant the final boss had been the main antagonist all along. But there was still a surprise element, as Chaos was an unexpected adversary, at least from the player's perspective. Representing the toughest challenge to feature within this particular iteration of Final Fantasy, Chaos featured more HP than any other foe the player could otherwise encounter, and to make matters worse, Chaos could make use of some very powerful abilities. With Chaos being formed from the essence of the Four Fiends, this saw it wield high-tier elemental spells, and they would each be a step beyond what was accessible to the player. All in all, it made for a pretty memorable encounter that would test many a challenge over the years, especially if their party setup was less than optimal by that point. As work commenced with Final Fantasy II, the development team were encouraged to let their imaginations run wild. It saw a whole host of game design elements layered over existing ones, with others introduced as original concept that they hoped would inspire players and push the franchise even further. But amongst all of this change, most of the traits introduced relating to the final boss encounter were retained. However, there were some intriguing changes. Right from the start of the game, it was made clear to the player who the big bad was, the Emperor, a devilish individual who was hellbent on subduing the land and forcing everyone to follow his rule. As a way of mixing things up, the developers opted against having the player fight the Emperor towards the start of the game, but he would be encountered numerous times as the game reached its conclusion. After being defeated in the initial encounter, the Emperor descended into the depths of hell. Upon his return, it was revealed that the Emperor had learned to harness the powers of the Underworld, something that had led to him undergoing a huge physical transformation. His objective was also changed from wanting to rule the world to wanting to destroy it. Within the encounter itself, the Emperor would now prove a much tougher challenge, featuring the most HP of any boss featured within the original game, and having access to a unique and powerful spell called Starfall. However, according to the game's data, Starfall had less magical power than Ultima, a spell that was accessible to the player. Final Fantasy III represented a significant change when it came to the wider role of the final boss. Unlike the two previous games, where the final encounter focused on a long-term foe who was transformed, in Final Fantasy III, the final boss had no active involvement in the narrative until the final chapter. For much of the game, Zande had served as the primary antagonist, 
and when he was encountered in the Crystal Tower, the fight had all the hallmarks. Not only did Zande have a significant amount of HP in comparison to previous bosses, he packed a punch, and his offensive capabilities would often become too much for even the most prepared of parties if the fight was not ended with a high degree of swiftness. But after his defeat, we got to see an evolution. Instead of the game being concluded, players learned that Zande had been manipulated. He had only served as the catalyst for the summoning of an even greater evil, Cloud of Darkness. In the immediate aftermath, Cloud of Darkness, whose design typified the otherworldly nature of the two previous final bosses, would then be encountered in an unwinnable scenario. An encounter which saw Cloud of Darkness have more HP than any other enemy in the game. But, after the party's defeat, thanks to Cloud of Darkness's signature move, Particle Beam, they would be revived, something that set the stage for the true final encounter. During the second encounter, Cloud of Darkness's HP was reduced, but it was still significant. Particle Beam would also still deal considerable damage, but having been weakened, its output was manageable, and this would allow the party to ultimately prevail. Final Fantasy IV would feature quite a few antagonists, with Golbez leading the way before players learnt about Zemus. But as the game drew to its close, we saw the previous trend pushed even further. In each of the three previous games, there had been a notion of surprise in relation to the final encounter. This either came in the form of a physical transformation, or the reveal of a master plan by another antagonist who had been operating in the shadows. But in Final Fantasy IV, both of those traits were disconnected. Zemus was revealed as the string puller who had been manipulating Golbez from the shadows, and he was encountered in ceremonial fashion at the conclusion of the game, as Golbez and Fusoya used double meteor to vanquish this foe. But as Zemus faded away, Zeromus was born. This represented a significant change from the three previous games, as Zeromus didn't represent some big plot point reveal. It was instead born out of the spirit and hatred of Zemus, wanting to do nothing more than destroy, and the primary motivation behind its inclusion at this point was around challenging players from a gameplay perspective. It represented a significant evolution, but outside of being the only time the final boss had not been encountered multiple times throughout the game, in one shape or another, Zeromus ticked almost every other box. Its design was very much otherworldly, it had more HP than any other enemy in the game, and it wielded a powerful, unique spell called Big Bang that would be used to greet players at the start of the encounter, as well as another ability called Black Hole. Real quick before we dive into exploring how Mystic Quest of all games ripped up the rulebook with regards to the concept of the final boss, did you know that we currently have over 265,000 subscribers, but that over 65% of the people watching our videos are not subscribed? If you're not subscribed, and you choose to subscribe right now, you can get us way closer to our next big milestone, hitting 300,000 subscribers. Final Fantasy Mystic Quest would be developed by a wholly different team than the one which had worked on the original Final Fantasy through to Final Fantasy IV. Compared to what was expected, this meant it saw significant changes to almost every aspect of design, but those who had been playing Saga, or the Final Fantasy Legends series as it was known in North America, would have felt right at home. But when it came to the final boss, what players encountered was neither derivative of Saga 3 or Final Fantasy 4. As the game reached its conclusion, the player would encounter the Dark King, who had been pulling the strings with the Vile Four and had been manipulating world events for centuries from the shadows. By this point, players had become accustomed to surprise final bosses, but the encounters would often be quite one-dimensional in terms of how they played out. With Mystic Quest, that notion was flipped on its head. It would see players attempt to fight a final boss who had four distinct phases, with the first being against the Dark King's normal form. The Dark King would subsequently transform three times, with the second form sprouting numerous arms and weapons, the third form inspired by arachnids, and the fourth and final form taking everything even further. Throughout, the Dark King would make use of a ridiculous amount of unique abilities, including Golden Web and Laser, but perhaps the most intriguing one would be Mega Flare. With Mystic Quest acting as something of an aside, Final Fantasy V would instead use a near identical approach to its final boss when compared to Final Fantasy IV. For much of the game, X Death served as the primary antagonist. 
He would be encountered numerous times and would undergo a significant transformation ahead of what many believed to be the final boss encounter. But, as had been the case in Final Fantasy IV, after X-Death had been defeated, the true final boss emerged, Neo X-Death. Neo X-Death was created after X-Death was consumed by the Void, and it had a single objective, to consume everything and turn the world into nothingness. But even though its surprise nature was similar, there were numerous design elements that made Neo X-Death act as a significant evolution. In the initial instance, even though X-Death was not the final boss, the fight acted as a prelude to a two-stage boss fight. This meant there was no chance for the party to rest in between, and players could easily be lulled into a false sense of security. With players expecting X-Death to be a single encounter, they would have been encouraged to blow all of their resources to try and attain victory, only to then receive a very nasty surprise after realising there was another, even more difficult challenge laying in wait. In that regard, not only was Neo X-Death the second phase of the encounter, it also had multiple parts. This meant players had to contend with a boss that featured a huge hike up in terms of HP, with it featuring over four times that of X-Death's treefall. Each of these parts could also use horrible abilities that were unique to this encounter. They included Grand Cross and Almagest, and it meant that unlike previous games where the final boss encounters were challenging but manageable, those who were coasting through Final Fantasy V would find that the only way to prevail was to undertake some serious preparation. As Final Fantasy developed across the 8-bit and 16-bit era, so too did the gameplay and narrative mechanics behind each respective final boss. And when Final Fantasy VI released in 1994, we got to see how many of these mechanics had been distilled, refined, and further expanded. Harkening back to the earlier days, it meant the final boss, Kefka, was a known entity throughout much of the game. And although he wouldn't appear as the first boss, Kefka would be fought numerous times throughout, through a combination of cinematic and more challenging encounters. As the game drew to its conclusion, the strongest version of Kefka would be faced, and much like some of the other more recent final bosses, by this point in the story, his desire was to bring about total destruction as he felt life and creation were meaningless. However, as a prelude to this fateful encounter, players would first need to best the statue of the gods. This concept had been utilised in Final Fantasy V, where players first needed to defeat X-Death before defeating Neo X-Death, and in Final Fantasy VI it was elevated in significant fashion. Ahead of the fight, players would need to select a priority ordering for their party. The initial four characters would start the encounter, and each time a character was KO'd, the next party in the list would enter the fight. It was a foreboding mechanic, and as it progressed, it was easy to understand why. As a prelude to facing Kefka, players would need to fight their way through an encounter that would have three separate phases, and in each phase there would be multiple targets, something reminiscent of the fight against Neo X-Death. It would only be after defeating Rest and Lady in the final phase that players would be allowed to square off against Kefka, with no rest or recuperation offered in between. The fight against Kefka would be a further war of attrition, and his physical transformation was reflective of the task ahead. But in an interesting twist, even though Kefka would have a significant amount of HP, it wasn't the most in the game. Kefka would instead be supplanted in this regard by Doom or Fiend depending on the localization, and this acted as the first time a final boss had not had the most HP of any encounter within their respective game. That wasn't to say the encounter would be easy however, as not only would Kefka have access to a multitude of unique abilities such as Heartless Angel, Havoc Wing and Forsaken, but the fight itself would also have multiple phases, and this meant, all things considered, this final boss encounter in its entirety would have a whopping six phases. Not only did this represent a considerable increase in what was seen within Final Fantasy V, but it would be foreboding for what players might expect in future final boss encounters. What followed Kefka as the final boss of Final Fantasy VII was just as impactful. But although there were plenty of key differences between Kefka and Sephiroth, there were also numerous similarities. Much like Kefka, Sephiroth was a known quantity throughout much of the game and would end up serving as both the main antagonist and the final boss. But unlike many previous bosses who had also featured this trait, Sephiroth was neither encountered in combat at any point prior to the final encounter, 
nor was he made all that visible as the narrative progressed. In many ways, this meant Sephiroth also served as a surprise as he was a complete unknown quantity outside of witnessing a strength secondhand through a flashback sequence. And when he was encountered, the metamorphic transformation was unlike anything the player could have anticipated. Much like previous games, the final encounter would be akin to a gauntlet. First, this would see the players square off against Genova Synthesis, the strongest form of Genova encountered throughout the game. Once defeated, the player would then need to make a choice, similar to the one made at the conclusion of Final Fantasy VI, and the choice they got to make would see them split the playable cast into one, two, or three separate parties depending on how they scored against numerous criteria, such as their average party level, how they defeated Genova Synthesis, and whether they'd obtained the secret characters. These parties would then square off against Bizarro Sephiroth, and upon its defeat, the primary party would stand face to face with Safer Sephiroth. Safer Sephiroth would have a significant amount of HP, but just like Kefka, it was no longer the highest amount in the game. However, unlike Kefka, it was the most of any mandatory encounter throughout the playthrough. What was intriguing, however, was that that may not always be the case as Safer Sephiroth's HP was dependent on numerous criteria and it could even be as low as 55,100. During the encounter itself, Safer Sephiroth could also make use of Heartless Angel, a move previously used by Kefka, and Supernova. This was an iconic attack that would deal massive damage and had the chance to inflict a few status effects, and it was also a loose note to Big Bang as they both had a connection with the stars. Following the defeat of Safer Sephiroth, players would then square off against Sephiroth again. But even though this was the true final boss encounter, it was more of a ceremonial one with the player unable to lose. Final Fantasy Tactics broke the mould in many ways, but its final boss would end up being quite derivative and reminiscent of many of the Final Fantasy games that were released in the early 90s. Throughout much of the narrative, players were fighting on multiple fronts, but as the plot started to conclude, it became clear that the Church of Galabados were up to some pretty dastardly deeds. This all came to a head when Ramza and his band of allies ventured inside the Necrol of Maland, making their way to the airship graveyard as they attempted to stop Fulmar from resurrecting Ultima. Here, the players would take part in a multi-fight, multi-phase final boss encounter that would see them first square off against Hashmal before tackling the true final boss, Ultima. In many ways, even though the objective was known, Ultima would fulfill the surprise trait as the final boss encounter represented the first time Ultima was seen within the game. And the fight itself then took a serious turn as even though Ultima would be somewhat otherworldly in the initial sense, during the second phase of the encounter it would transform into something much less palatable. This encounter would be one of the most difficult in the entire game with Ultima having a significant amount of HP and summoning allies to assist. Across the two phases, Ultima would also make use of some powerful spells such as Enhanced Ultima and Divine Ultima. But there was one move that served as a significant nod, as Ultima could use Grand Cross, a move that was previously used by Neo Death in Final Fantasy V. In Final Fantasy VIII, through Ultima Seer, the development team resurfaced numerous traits associated with final bosses and even introduced some new ones. From a narrative perspective, even though Ultima Seer was a surprise, it wasn't as much of a surprise as say Zeromus, Neo X Death or Ultima, instead acting as more of a middle ground like Cloud of Darkness. As such, Ultima Seer only became known after the antagonist players believed to be the main antagonist, Idea, was defeated for a second time. However, it wasn't until the final encounter which took place in Ultima Seer's castle that players would meet Ultima Seer face to face. In the first phase of this multi-phase encounter, players would square off against Ultima Seer in her human form, and yet again there would be a party selection mechanic at play. However, unlike in Final Fantasy VI and VII where players would have the ability to choose, in Final Fantasy VIII 
The party selected for the fight was random, with fallen party members replaced by random members from the reserve roster. After being defeated in her human form, Ultima Seer would summon Griever. That the final boss encounter had multiple phases by this point was no means a new concept, but in no previous instance had the final boss ever been removed from the encounter in favour of another foe. The closest to this was Ultima in Final Fantasy Tactics who summoned allies to support, but Ultima was still a consistent feature throughout. Upon the defeat of Griever, Ultima Seer would then undergo a transformation, something that had now been very established as a hallmark trait for final bosses. But it wouldn't be until the fourth phase transformation, something we hadn't seen since Mystic Quest, that everything got pretty serious. It would be during this fourth phase that Ultima Seer would start to tick some more established traits. For example, there would be a huge hike up in HP, and this mirrored Sephiroth as Ultima Seer would have the highest HP, but only when looking at mandatory bosses. Ultima Seer would also have multiple targetable parts, and to cap things off, players would have to deal with some very powerful abilities such as Apocalypse and Hell's Judgment. By its conclusion, players would have overcome an incredible foe, and they would have experienced an encounter unlike anything else seen before within the franchise. After the decision had been made to have Final Fantasy IX wholesale resurface many of the traits found within the 8-bit and 16-bit era of the franchise, the developers explored how and where they could appear. And with regards to the final boss, the inspirations were quite clear. Much like Final Fantasy 3, 4 and 5, this would see the final boss, Necron, appear by complete surprise after Kuja had been defeated. The way Necron manifested also bore strong resemblance to Zeromus as it was awakened by Kuja's negative emotions, and its motivations were almost identical to Cloud of Darkness and Neo X Death, as after witnessing the actions of Kuja, Necron resolved to destroy the origin of life and create nothingness. The fight itself continued the more recent trend of the final boss having the most HP of any mandatory encounter, and its appearance was indeed otherworldly. Necron would also use a suite of unique abilities, including the likes of Neutron Ring and Blue Shockwave, but perhaps the most infamous was Grand Cross, a move that had previously been used by Neo X Death and Ultima. And through its animation sequence, Grand Cross also continued the connection between final bosses and the cosmos. By the time Final Fantasy X had been released, many of the core traits associated with final bosses had been established. But perhaps because the developers still wanted to try and keep players on their toes, the final boss of Final Fantasy X would end up being quite different from many of the previous games, while also being quite familiar. Throughout much of the game, Seymour and Sin were positioned as the major antagonists, but as the game concluded, even though they were both fought against, the story continued. As such, the player ventured deeper inside Sin, something that would lead to a fateful encounter against Ject. This wasn't so much of a surprise, at least in comparison to some previous games, but that Ject then proceeded to transform into a colossal Aeon was. The fight itself was emotionally charged, and it had two clear phases. Ject would have access to some unique moves such as Ject's Beam, which mirrored Cloud of Darkness's Particle Beam, and was supported in combat by Pagodas, similar to Ultima in Final Fantasy Tactics. Ject's HP was also much higher than any previous boss, further emphasising that the fight against the final Aeon was the final boss encounter, as it ticked almost every box. But here's where things got interesting, as it wasn't the final encounter. That would instead be against Yu Yevon, who was very much a surprise. Yu Yevon's design was nothing like anything seen before in the game, and it too had a significant amount of HP, as well as being supported by two pagodas. However, even though Yu Yevon could use Ultima and Gravijar, neither were unique to this encounter, and as party members were given permanent auto life, it was nearly impossible to lose unless the player actively wanted to do so. It meant there were clear parallels to the final stages of Final Fantasy VII, where after defeating Safer Sephiroth, the player would then fight Sephiroth in an encounter that could not be lost. Even though Final Fantasy XI was unlike any of the previous Final Fantasy games that had been developed, the creative minds working on the project attempted to ensure that many of the hallmark Final Fantasy traits were still present. This remained true in numerous areas from the adoption of jobs through to the many monsters players would encounter and the spells they could wield, and it also remained true in relation to the final boss. How the Shadow Law came to be was reminiscent of Final Fantasy IV and IX, 
as it only came to existence following the death of another. In this case, it was a once noble warrior called Raugrim who died with anger in his heart. The Shadow Lord was born from this anger. The main difference was that this event did not occur at the storyline's conclusion. Instead, it happened as the story commenced, and players were then tasked with attempting to stop the chaos the Shadow Lord was attempting to sow. This all came to a head inside Castle's Vale. In the ensuing encounter, the players would find that the Shadow Lord fulfilled many of the typical final boss traits, even though the fight had been adapted to a different genre. This would see the Shadow Lord have a significant amount of HP in comparison to previous bosses that were encountered as part of the story, and there were two distinct phases. However, unlike any previous game that had contained multi-encounter or multi-phase fights, in Final Fantasy XI, the player was afforded time to rest and recuperate ahead of the second phase of the encounter commencing. Throughout both phases, the Shadow Lord would also use a plethora of unique abilities. These included the likes of Dark Nova, Giga Splash, Implosion, and Umbra Smash. And although none were inherently linked to previous final bosses, the sheer volume witnessed was pretty impressive. Final Fantasy Tactics Advance featured a narrative that had an unorthodox premise, and it saw a few changes to the typical final boss formula. In the previous incarnations, the final boss had been a surprise element born from the negative emotions of the main antagonist. In another, Cloud of Darkness had been encountered in an unwinnable scenario before being defeated within the final boss battle. Both of those traits would manifest through Lednar Twem, one of the game's main antagonists, who would be made invincible until the final encounter commenced. But even though Lednar Twem was one of the main antagonists, he was not the overarching villain. That mantle was instead reserved for Le Grimm. After Lednar had been defeated, the player would square off against Queen Remedy, Mute's mother, in her human form. But after being defeated, Remedy then transformed into Le Grimm to surprise players and bring about the third part of this final boss medley. And it was here that we would see further expansion in terms of the array of unique moves wielded by a final boss. With Final Fantasy X-2 serving as the first major expansion to a mainline Final Fantasy game, even though there were some significant cost efficiencies on display with regards to asset reusage, from a gameplay perspective, the developers chose to push boundaries. It saw a progressive new battle system created, and when it came to the final boss, there was also some noticeable differences compared to the past, but not in the ways that might have been expected. Xu Yin was a spirit consumed by negative emotions, but instead of being born anew, as had been the case with many previous final bosses, it was the negative emotions that sustained Xu Yin as he lay dormant within the Den of Woe. After being released, Xu Yin attempted to enact a nefarious plan, total destruction of Spira as a way of ending the constant cycle of war. To achieve this, Xu Yin attempted to use an ancient piece of machina called Vegnagun, but after it was damaged beyond use, Xu Yin squared off against the party himself for a final showdown. This showdown would be quite unlike anything seen before within the franchise. Not only was there no surprise element in terms of who the final boss was, but there was no surprise physical transformation of any kind to heighten the encounter. Xu Yin would still make use of unique abilities, but this element was also understated, as Xu Yin's abilities were inspired by Titus's overdrives. From the outset, the development team working on Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles wanted the story to be much more condensed in comparison to a typical main numbered game. But even though that was the case, they still wanted the final boss encounter to be impactful and representative of the many final bosses that had graced the franchise up until this point. It meant even though players were led to believe that Rain was the ultimate big bad, after Rain was defeated, there was one final challenge laying in wait. Unwilling to accept defeat, Rain would surprise players by merging with Mio to create Memiroa, or Mio Rain depending on the localization. Memiroa was the very definition of otherworldly in terms of design, and from a gameplay perspective, it would serve as a significant test for players, especially if they were playing single player. This was because not only were there multiple targetable parts, but players had to be careful of avoiding Memoroa's punishing enhanced beam attacks, which were reminiscent of Cloud of Darkness's particle beam. In Before Crisis Final Fantasy VII, the final boss was quite the spectacle. As the narrative had developed, more and more focus was placed around the Zerkanade Summer Materia, 
that had been grafted to Elfei as part of one of Hojo's experimentations, and once Fajito realised, he attempted to try and figure out how to extract its power. With the game reaching its conclusion, Fajito succeeded in using the Zirconade materia, but only at the cost of his own life. And this adhered to the classic transformation trait, as Fajito inserted the Zirconade materia into his own body, something that led to a significant physical transformation. But it didn't represent the final encounter, only serving as a prelude. After Fajito had been defeated, Zirconade was released from its shackles, and after traversing through numerous waves of enemies, a very tough final boss encounter would ensue that was somewhat reminiscent of Cloud of Darkness. During the initial phase, the player would find the fight unwinnable, as Zirconade would absorb their attacks. But where before Crisis took things further was that the second and third phases were also unwinnable. Each would conclude with Zirconade using a devastating beam attack, something that was also reminiscent of how Cloud of Darkness ended that first unwinnable encounter. After this string of defeats, the player would then receive messages of support from the various allies they had made, something that would push them to continue the fight. But in a first, Zirconade would not be defeated once its HP had been reduced. Instead, the player would need to damage Zirconade until they learnt a Limit Break ability. They would then need to survive long enough for the bar to fill so that they could use the Limit Break and win the day. With everything combined, it meant that even though there were clear inspirations, Before Crisis was unlike anything seen before, especially with the cinematic element added at its conclusion. Unlike many other entries in the Final Fantasy franchise, Dirge of Cerberus Final Fantasy VII was much more akin to a third-person shooter than a role-playing game. As such, there were some fundamental shifts made to game design, but there was, of course, still room for a final boss encounter. As the plot progressed, numerous candidates came to fruition, including Vice the Immaculate and Omega Weapon, but very few would have predicted the surprise twist of Vice merging with Omega Weapon to create a new entity called Omega Vice. Now, Due to the shift in genre, the final boss encounter had quite a different format. This saw Vincent first need to traverse through a few different stages, and then some smaller encounters against the likes of Omega Cocoon, before then coming face to face with Omega Vice itself. This would have numerous nuances, such as the ability for Vice and Omega Weapon to separate, and when combined, Omega Meteor would be their signature attack. Omega Vice could also enter a heightened state where its damage output would be increased for a short period of time. But outside of the numerous stages that came before the fight itself, there were no phases during the actual encounter, and the in-fight transformations really didn't signify that the boss was up in the ante. What was different, however, was that the final boss encounter took place inside the final boss itself due to its sheer scale, and this was very reminiscent of Final Fantasy X. Now, by this point in the franchise, it meant there had been some significant evolutions around the concept of the final boss, and even though it still served the same purpose, raising the stakes as each game drew to its conclusion, the way it delivered on that purpose had gone through many, many iterations. Some common trends had started to emerge, however. It was very likely that the final boss would go through some kind of physical transformation, either as the fight was instigated or even during the encounter itself, with those bosses that didn't falling in the minority camp. There was also a trend towards final bosses being late, unexpected arrivals in their respective stories that would often catch players by complete surprise. And we'd start to see a trend towards fights having multiple phases up in the ante even further. Final Fantasy XII spent longer in development than any previous game associated with the franchise, and as it drew towards its conclusion, players were treated with spectacular cinematics, emotionally fueled encounters, and of course, a rather epic final boss. It had been clear for some time that Vayne Solidor would serve as the primary evil that needed to be stopped, and as players headed into the final encounter, they would square off against Vayne in his base human form. This was reminiscent of the encounter against Ultima Sia, and as the fight progressed, the similarities would continue, with traits from other encounters also seen. After being defeated in his human form, Vayne transformed into Vayne Novus. This was achieved by using his body as a conduit for Nethersite, and it was here that a lesser used trait would resurface, as Vayne Novus would be supported by five allies called Sephira. 
During this phase, Vayne would also start to use more pronounced, unique abilities such as Azure Vortis and Contempt, but it would be the next phase that brought everything together. Having seen Vayne fail twice, Venar decided to intervene. In an action that was reminiscent of Ultima Seer's fusing with Griever, this would see Venar merge with Vayne Solidor, pulling in parts of the Sky Fortress Bahamut to create a wholly original being known as the Undying. It was a significant transformation, and this combination of sources most definitely made the Undying seem like an otherworldly being. The nature of the transformation was also a complete surprise, as up until that point, Venar had been a non-active participant, at least in the physical sense. With the Sky Fortress Bahamut also being part of the merger, it would see the Undying use numerous abilities that were linked with the Venerable Summon, such as Giga Flare Sword, Mega Flare, and Terra Flare. This was a new association, but there was also room for older associations to come to the fore, as the ability Piercing Elemental could also be a subtle reference back to Chaos, the original final boss. Even though Final Fantasy XII Revenant Wings served as a direct follow-up to Final Fantasy XII and it featured many of the same concepts, when it came to the final boss encounter, the two approaches couldn't have been further apart. Throughout large portions of the game, it was believed that Judge of Wings, aka Midia, was the big bad. But after Midia herself was beaten, she revealed that she was a mere pawn, acting at the behest of Fail Thanos. It meant that from a narrative perspective, the appearance of Fail Thanos was not too dissimilar to Ultima Sia, but it was from a gameplay perspective that everything became a bit more interesting. After heading inside the womb of Fail Thanos, Instead of coming face to face with Fail Thanos himself, the party were instead greeted by Fail Thanos Exultant, a huge demon. The fight itself would then be pretty tough, as Fail Thanos Exultant was constructed of multiple parts that were spread across the battlefield. The connection with Final Fantasy XII then came from an unlikely source, Bahamut, who would appear once the health of Fail Thanos Medi had been reduced by half. After this encounter, the player would then square off against Fail Thanos in his regular form, and that's where a weird parallel with Sephiroth came in. Even though players could still lose the fight against Fail Thanos, the difficulty was much, much less when compared to the fight against Fail Thanos Exultant, assuming of course that players were paying attention. And this made the fight feel more like one based on ceremony, as opposed to one where it felt like there was a genuine chance of failure. That's not all though, as there was another connection with Sephiroth. In Final Fantasy VII, the amount of health safer Sephiroth had was dependent on numerous criteria, and in Revenant Wings, Fail Thanos Exultant could also be made more difficult depending on player choice. In this case, if the player had completed every mission, Fail Thanos Exultant would be upgraded to level 99, making it one of the hardest Final Fantasy bosses in the history of the franchise, something we covered in a previous video. Given that both Before Crisis and Dirge of Cerberus had featured quite unorthodox final boss encounters, it wasn't too surprising that Crisis Core Final Fantasy VII would also feature an unorthodox conclusion. But perhaps due to its closer connection with Final Fantasy VII, the way the developers chose to have the final boss encounter feature within Crisis Core was also quite derivative. It had been a long time since the final boss had been encountered early on in the story, with the previous time this had happened being Final Fantasy VI. But with Genesis Rhapsodos a constant thorn in the side, he was fought midway through the game at an abandoned Mako excavation facility near Modeoheim. Genesis could also be fought during Mission 515, but the next narrative-based encounter would be the final boss encounter. Much like what had been seen in Final Fantasy VII with Sephiroth, this would see Genesis use the goddess material to transform into a new being called Genesis Avatar. The encounter itself would see a few unique abilities surface, such as Overdrive and Purgatorial Wave, with Genesis Avatar also having scaling health that was dependent on the difficulty setting. But what further emphasised the connection with Final Fantasy VII was that after Genesis Avatar was defeated, Genesis would be encountered, with this fight being much easier by comparison. This was also very reminiscent of Revenant Wings, something that must have been coincidental as the two games were only released five months apart in Japan and had completely different development teams. Within the second encounter, which would also see Genesis have differing HP levels depending on the difficulty level selected, the player would be subjected to a much wider array of unique abilities such as Dancing Sword and Twister Strike, 
Genesis would also use Apocalypse, an ability that had previously been used by Ultima Sia. However, in this game, Apocalypse was not unique to the final boss, as the player could also make use of this ability through the DMW system. Final Fantasy Tactics AT would feature a rather unorthodox final boss, both in terms of how it was presented from a visual perspective and from a gameplay perspective. Throughout, the party would be attempting to thwart the schemes of Elua. One of the earlier skirmishes would land the party in Zelia, where they would encounter a demon called Nekia, or at least they'd encounter a small part of Nekia. This would be quite foreboding, and it represented an interesting twist. In previous games, such as Final Fantasy II and VI, where the main antagonist also served as the final boss, there were easier encounters that took place before the final showdown. But where this differed in Tactics A2 was that Nekia was not the main antagonist. And as such, that Nekia was encountered partway through the story was meant more as a way to tease the challenge ahead as opposed to something that would help drive the story forward. That challenge manifested as Nekia was revealed as the final boss, with players realising that the encounter they had before was only against its hand. Nekia in its full form was far more monstrous, with it being so large that it was even integrated into the stage itself as a way of navigating to the various parts. Not only was this a huge challenge in comparison to previous final bosses, who had been large but not that large, it was also a nice twist on the transformation aspect, as Nekia had not changed its form from the first encounter to the last, but the player's perception had. What was also very intriguing about Nekia was how its ability set pulled from the past. It would see Nekia have access to a huge array of unique abilities, with two very noticeable ones being Grand Cross and Apocalypse. With Dissidia acting as a pretty solid tribute to the entire franchise, it was rather fitting that Chaos, who started it all back in 1987, would return as the main antagonist and final boss. However, even though its appearance was inspired by the original Final Fantasy, this was not the same Chaos, and this meant its motivations, after being driven insane, were to create a world where nothing could exist. With the genre change, some of the established traits were stripped away, and there was no big physical transformation at the commencement of the encounter. However, there was at least one core trait retained, as Chaos would need to be defeated in three consecutive instances without the player being defeated once. As the fight progressed, players would then bear witness to perhaps the most extreme transformation to date, as Chaos would go from being comparable in size to the player's character to dwarfing them. During this portion of the fight, Chaos would also wield four giant swords with the entire moveset changing, but it would ultimately not be enough to prevent skilled players from defeating Chaos and winning the encounter. With Final Fantasy The Four Heroes of Light having its roots in some of the earliest entries into the franchise, the traits associated with the final boss would end up being rather fitting. It would see Chaos return yet again to serve as the final boss, but even though this particular iteration had the same name, there was very little in common, from a gameplay perspective at least, with the original final boss. The fight would consist of three phases, with the initial phase being against Chaos in its default human form, but even though it would prove a challenge, similar to previous final boss encounters, the human form would only serve as an appetizer. After transforming, Chaos would see a significant increase to its damage output, and to pay tribute to the original Chaos, it would start using spells such as Blaze and Tsunami. At the conclusion of the second phase, a trait only previously seen within Final Fantasy XI would resurface, as the player would be healed before the final phase commenced. This would then see a further transformation, and in this final form Chaos would not only gain new appendages, but it would gain access to two new moves, Big Bang and Black Hole. On the surface, this might have felt quite random, as they were previously associated with Zero Mess, but prior to working on the Four Heroes of Light, the development team had worked on the Final Fantasy IV remake on the Nintendo DS. Takashi Tokita was also a prominent part of all three projects, having been the lead designer for Final Fantasy IV when it released on the Super Famicom, the director of the Nintendo DS 3D remake, and the director of the Four Heroes of Light. For much of Final Fantasy XIII, players found themselves squaring off against a foul sea known as Bartandalus. But right as the game reached its conclusion, and Bartandalus was defeated, the rug was pulled out and often, another foul sea was revealed as the final boss. 
Like many of the earlier final bosses, Orphan was only able to exist following the defeat of the previous foe. The main difference was that whereas in those instances, hatred or malice were the overriding emotions at play, the birth of Orphan was a purposeful act on the part of another foul sea called Minerva, and Orphan even thanked the player for the part they played in bringing it to life. The fight itself would feel reminiscent of Final Fantasy VII, where the recurring boss, in that case Genova, would act as a prelude to the final boss. Sephiroth would then be split into two main encounters, with the third being ceremonial. Final Fantasy XIII was a close match, with Bartandalus being fought as a prelude before two very different encounters against Orphan. In the first of these encounters, the player would need to contend with numerous unique abilities such as Kaleidoscopic Ray and the bane of most players, Progenitorial Wrath, a move that could inflict instant death. After being defeated, a second encounter would ensue, but even though there would be no chance for rest or changing equipment within the natural intended flow, should the player be defeated or simply want to retry things if they weren't going as planned, the start of the second encounter would serve as a new checkpoint. This time, Orphan would have reduced HP, a trait seen many times before with multi-stage final bosses. But even though that was the case, and moves such as Progenitorial Wrath were no longer used, the fight was not easy. Part of this was due to Orphan's now incredibly high defensive stats. This meant it would need to be staggered to be damaged. The other factor was that a time limit was placed on the encounter thanks to Doom being cast at its commencement. Orphan also introduced a very interesting trait, a specific weakness. Whereas the first encounter could end in a frustrating manner due to instant death, so too could the second encounter, but this time it would be in the player's favour. When staggered, there was a chance that Orphan could be defeated via instant death, but the chance was quite low. As shared within the Final Fantasy XIII Ultimania, this weakness was included as a tribute back to the creator, the final boss in the original Saga game, which had a connection to Final Fantasy due to the name being used for its North American release. As Final Fantasy Dimensions was created by the same team that worked on the Four Heroes of Light, there were quite a few similarities in terms of the thematic makeup of the final boss. Elgo was a consistent presence throughout the narrative, with the player led to believe they were actually an ally but in a shock twist, it turned out that Elgo was in fact the main evildoer. As the game reached its conclusion, Elgo would be faced in a two-stage encounter, but after their defeat, everything went sideways and a surprise final boss appeared, Chaos Elgo. This continued the association between Chaos and the final boss, but there was also an association between Chaos Elgo and previous bosses featured within works produced by the same development team. For example, Chaos Elgo would not only use Big Bang, but also Black Hole, two abilities used by Chaos in the Four Heroes of Light as well as Zeromus. Chaos Elgo would also tweak the typical formula. This would see the fight feature subtle phases with emphasis placed on in-phase transformations as opposed to transformations signifying the start of a new phase. This would manifest during the second phase as Chaos Elgo could switch between three unique forms, something that would affect the abilities it could use. With Final Fantasy XIV following in the footsteps of Final Fantasy XI, there was a high degree of anticipation. But due to the game's dismal performance at launch, main story progression took a back seat as the development team attempted to fix more pressing issues. It meant that even though Final Fantasy XIV released towards the end of 2010, it wouldn't be until mid-August 2012, some 653 days later, that players would be able to witness a conclusion to the base game. That conclusion came in the form of a rather lengthy encounter against Nail Van Darnus as part of the Riven Road trial, which was added in patch 1.23a. The fight consisted of two phases, with the first against Nail Van Darnus' standard form. However, within this phase were micro phases. In the initial sense, Nail would only use melee attacks, but after being reduced to 75% of its health, things would kick up a notch. As it progressed, Nail would also be able to summon Lunar Fragments to aid their cause, and they would deal significant damage if allowed to fall. After being defeated, Nail would request more power, something that would see Nail Vandanus transformed into Nail Deastanus. The second phase would play out in similar fashion to the first phase, but from a design perspective, there was an intriguing addition, as Nail Deastanus could use Mega Flare, an ability not associated with the final boss since Final Fantasy XII and Mystic Quest before that. <laughs> 
Whereas the original Dissidia featured a modernized version of an iconic final boss, its sequel, Dissidia Duodecim, decided to throw out the rulebook. Unlike every previous Final Fantasy game, this meant Duodecim did not feature a final boss, at least not in the traditional sense. Instead, as the game drew to its conclusion, the player would take control of five conventional fights, albeit of increased difficulty. It meant there was no single entity that was the main focal point, and only once each fight had been won, with the final duel, seeing lightning square off against Garland, would the game reach its conclusion. With Final Fantasy Type-0 spending a considerable amount of time in development, there was a lot of expectation ahead of its release, and as the game drew to its conclusion, players got to witness a final boss that was rather substantial. For a while, Sid Allstein had been positioned as the big bad, but after his scheme ended in complete failure, Sid was transformed into a new being called the Rursen Arbiter. The fight itself would end up being quite the spectacle, with players taken to a lavish stage to fight against their new foe. They would also find that the Rursen Arbiter could not be harmed, and the fight would only progress after the entire party had been defeated. This would serve as an extreme throwback to Zirkanade, the final boss of Before Crisis, which made sense as Hajime Tabata, the director of Type-0, also directed Before Crisis. It would only be during the second phase that the Rursen Arbiter could be harmed, but the mechanics were not as simple as just dealing damage. Each party member would need to land a break site and then absorb the Phantoma that was released. This would gradually weaken the Rursen Arbiter, making it something of an inverse encounter. Players would start the second phase with likely their strongest party setup, squaring off against the Rursen Arbiter in its strongest form, but as the weaker and weaker party members were forced into the fray, the Rursen Arbiter would also weaken. Final Fantasy XIII 2 introduced a brand new antagonist who did not feature within the original game, but from a mechanical perspective, Caius Ballad was not too dissimilar from Bartandalus. Both would be encountered numerous times throughout the game, with Caius taking this to extreme levels. However, after it became clear to Caius that he could not win after one of the final encounters, he would end up transforming into something much grander, Jet Bahamut. Even though some previous bosses had shown associations with Bahamut, such as the Undying from Final Fantasy XII, this was the first instance where the association was made quite literal. And as if being named Jet Bahamut wasn't enough, the encounter also included Amber Bahamut and Garnet Bahamut. Unlike previous add-ons, such as the Pagodas in Final Fantasy XII, or even the Ultima Demons in Final Fantasy Tactics, Amber and Garnet were active participants in the fight, and it was only when they were incapacitated that Jet Bahamut could even be targeted. Leaning on Bahamut's traits, Jet Bahamut would be able to use Giga Flare and Terra Flare, but Mega Flare was replaced by Exa Flare. It's unclear why this decision was made, but these moves aligned with the variants of Bahamut which had appeared within the compilation of Final Fantasy VII. These extreme moves, which could be enhanced should Amber or Garnet not be defeated quickly enough, would then be supplemented by a whole host of unique abilities like Abyssal Yawn and Judgment Blade. Instead of continuing to try and fix Final Fantasy XIV, the development team realised they would need to do a much more literal reset. The result was Final Fantasy XIV A Realm Reborn. In reality, many elements did carry over, including Nail Vandanus, but roles were changed according to the new plan, and it meant Nail no longer featured as the final boss for the base game. That role was instead given to a new character called La Habrea. Players were aware of La Habrea throughout much of the story related to the base game, and he would serve as the final boss of the main scenario quest called The Ultimate Weapon that was associated with Patch 2.0. The fight, back when A Realm Reborn launched, was associated with a dungeon called the Praetorium. Within, players would need to fight through a gauntlet of bosses that included Nero, Gaius, and Ultima Weapon before then squaring off against La Habrea. This series featured quite a few interesting nuances in comparison to what had been seen before. For example, La Habrea would have an involvement in the fight against Ultima Weapon, leading players to believe that once the fight concluded, the story would progress. Another twist was that in the fight that followed, players would not actually be fighting against La Habrea, at least in the literal sense. Instead, players had to fight against Thancred, who was being mind controlled by La Habrea. This final encounter would also be much easier than the fight against Ultima Weapon, resurfacing a trait seen a handful of times before, where the final leg of the final boss gauntlet would be more ceremonial than there to push players to the limits of their abilities. <laughs> 
As such, the fight against mind-controlled Thancred wasn't all that comprehensive, but there was a connection with Final Fantasy VII. This came through the Shadow Flare ability, which was used by both Thancred, Safer Sephiroth and Genesis Avatar. Now, this was how the fight used to be, but due to the ever-evolving nature of Final Fantasy XIV, much of this has changed, and as of patch 6.1, everything just spoken about no longer exists. This means that instead of facing La Habrea as part of a gauntlet within the Praetorium, it's now a solo quest battle that has been elevated in status. As such, the encounter is no longer ceremonial, with La Habrea's ability set expanded in a significant manner, and the encounter having two distinct phases. The first phase will be similar to other, more recent final boss encounters, with the player taking part in an unwinnable encounter. However, following the intervention of a third party, in this case Heidelin, they will be revived and given a second bite of the cherry. During the second phase, the player would receive the Blessing of Light status. This would increase damage and health, making the fight more sustainable, and although La Habrea would put up a significant challenge, the player would be able to overcome the odds. That such a change was made to the makeup of this part of Final Fantasy XIV served as evidence that the development team want to ensure the entire experience is of the highest quality, as opposed to accolades only being geared towards the most recent expansions. Final Fantasy XIV Patch 2.55 was released as part of Before the Fall on the 31st of March 2015. It would signal the conclusion of A Realm Reborn's main scenario, and everything would come to a head during a quest called The Steps of Faith. After the quest commenced, players would get to experience something quite unique. Unlike every previous final boss to have appeared across the breadth of the entire franchise, this would see the player take part in a much larger skirmish, where they would attempt to stop a huge dragon called Vishab from progressing along a specified path. It meant that even though stopping Vishap was the ultimate goal, its large pool of health would make a head-on assault quite difficult. Instead, players would need to combine their efforts with the use of interactive elements such as the Bertha Cannons to deal additional damage. Using these interactive elements would also help when dealing with the numerous allies that would accompany Vishap throughout the encounter. Many final bosses had been joined by allies in the past, but for this particular encounter, the sheer scale was unlike anything seen before, as outside of specified mini-bosses such as the Armored Dragon, there would also be lots of smaller enemies appearing throughout the encounter as an attempt to overwhelm the player party. Perhaps the most intriguing aspect of the encounter was that Vishap was not at all concerned about defeating the player, but even though that may have been the case, it would still perform offensive actions. This could also lead to a curious scenario, however, as the player could lose without even being defeated by Vishap. Instead, a game over state would be enacted should Vishap reach its destination before being defeated. Although in its initial days, the Steps of Faith was meant to be an encounter that offered some variety through its unorthodox mechanics due to power creep, those mechanics were seldom used in favour of just brute forcing Vishap down and it was perhaps because of this that in patch 6.2 it was replaced by a solo quest battle. The player would now be joined by numerous NPC allies in a far more structured fight that would see attention focused on the mini-bosses and Vishab as sequential parts of the same encounter as opposed to them being fought in tandem. The Jeopardy would still be there however in relation to losing without the player themselves being defeated, as Vishab would need to be felled before the last player ally. As the third iteration into the Final Fantasy XIII trilogy, Lightning Returns mixed things up by ditching the classic party dynamic. This saw focus placed firmly on Lightning, with players able to control her actions in combat via the style change active time battle system. Based on this, the narrative was also narrowed in focus, with many previous characters appearing in cameo roles and a new antagonist introduced called Bunavelza. Acting as both the main antagonist and the final boss, Benevelza was a consistent presence throughout. As such, it meant there was no real surprise element, but due to its role within the narrative, there was definitely an otherworldly element to its design. In spite of Lightning Returns moving away from many established elements, the final boss encounter would end up being very nostalgic, adopting many traits seen throughout the years often in blatant fashion. The fight would have four distinct phases, with Bunavelda gaining new abilities with each new phase, as well as an ever-increasing pool of HP. In the initial phase, this would include Almagest, a move previously used by Xdeath 
but as the fight extended, Bonavolza would gain access to Heartless Angel, a move made famous by both Kefka and Sephiroth. Beyond that, there were numerous illusions. Falling Star and Janethliak Him both had a strong similarity with Starfall, a move used by the Emperor in Final Fantasy II, and then Dissidia. Wings of Destruction was similar to Havoc Wing, another move used by Kefka. Divine Punishment was used by Chaos in Dissidia, and Hypernova would serve as another allusion to Sephiroth via Supernova. The other interesting trait was that Bunavelza had adaptive HP. In the initial instance, this would be dependent on the difficulty the game was being played on, which was identical to what was seen within Crisis Core, but when playing on New Game Plus, Bunavelza would be replaced by Bunavelza Plus, but only if the player had completed the bonus dungeon known as the Ultimate Layer. Final Fantasy Dimensions 2 featured numerous changes in comparison to the original game, but its final boss, Neo Chaos Bahamut, would end up being rather spectacular and would feature numerous established traits. Chaos Bahamut would emerge as an antagonist as the store of Dimensions 2 developed, and based on its name, there were clear connections with both the original Chaos, but also Bahamut. However, Chaos Bahamut would only serve as an appetizer. As the game reached its conclusion, Chaos Bahamut would be encountered numerous times. However, as seen with Zerkanade in Before Crisis, the player would be unable to win despite having numerous attempts. It would only be after Muti used the power of Mega Flare that Chaos Bahamut would fall, but this would only give rise to the true final boss, Neo Chaos Bahamut. The illusions here were very obvious, as the name itself drew from the original final boss, Chaos, and the final boss of Final Fantasy V, Neo X Death and it further strengthened the association between Bahamut and final bosses. The fight itself will consist of three phases, due to Dimensions 2 adopting the typical mobile mechanic of having three waves per encounter, and during each stage, Neo Chaos Bahamut would gain progressively more HP. For Mobius Final Fantasy, the developers wanted to offer an alternative retelling of the original story, and this saw Chaos return as both the main antagonist and the final boss of Season 1. However, unlike the original game, Chaos was not Garland. Chaos was once human, but for the final encounter he was transformed into a huge obelisk. Ahead of the encounter's second phase, Chaos would then transform again, this time into a demonic creature that was much more representative of the original Chaos's design. Chaos would then make use of numerous abilities such as Flood of Despair and Chaotic Whispers, but outside of there being an association with the original Chaos, the other final boss traits were quite loose in comparison to many previous final bosses. Acting as the first major expansion to Final Fantasy XIV, there was heavy focus placed on the story of Heavensward. And as the main scenario quest developed, it became clear that something was afoot with Archbishop Thord and the Seventh. As the story reached its initial conclusion, players confronted their adversary face to face. But as I've been seen many times before, the Thorden players knew was not the Thorden they would encounter, as after using Nidhogg's right eye, absorbing the essence of Lehabrea, and accessing the power of the Warring Triad, Thorden became an avatar of Thorden I, aka Primal King Thorden. The developers also chose to go quite hardcore on the notion of allies. Within the previous final boss encounter against Vishap, there had been quite a few notable enemies and numerous cannon fodder. But for this encounter, Thorden would be supported by the Heaven's Ward, a group of 12 knights. This was in itself quite a significant evolution, but it also evolved a notion introduced within Final Fantasy XIII too, as the Heaven's Ward were linked with the power of Thorden's ultimate attack, Knights of the Round. In order to reduce its effectiveness, this would see the player need to defeat each individual summoned knight, with the order of defeat also important, for helping to ensure the limit gauge did not increase at a faster rate. The story of Heaven's Ward would reach its conclusion with patch 3.3 dubbed Revenge of the Horde. It would see the player take part in a trial called The Final Steps of Faith, where they would face off against Nidhogg, albeit through another possession. With Estenian having obtained two of Nidhogg's eyes, the spirit possessed the fearsome dragoon and subsequently transformed him into its original form as a huge dragon, and what commenced was a pretty epic encounter. By this point in the franchise, multi-phase bosses were nothing new, but seldom were four phases used, with Ultima Sia and Bunavelza serving as notable examples. With Nidhogg, this trait would return, and what made it quite intriguing was just how different the individual phases would end up being. 
Similar to the two aforementioned bosses, the first phase would serve as an appetizer. It would see players square off against the final boss in its base form, but the encounter itself would not be too challenging. Once cleared, Nidhogg would retreat, and aligning with Ultima Sia would bring forth allies to fight in its stead. After being defeated, Nidhogg would then revert back to Estenien. This saw the enemy shrink in size, the opposite of what would normally be expected from a mid-boss fight transformation. But even though Estenian was much small in terms of literal size, this phase packed a punch thanks to abilities such as Ak Morn. Where things differed, however, was that the final phase wouldn't be all that grand in comparison to previous four phase encounters. It would see Nidhogg return, albeit now with an angrier colour palette, and there were a few new moves introduced to complement those used by Nidhogg in the initial phase. At the conclusion of the initial season of Final Fantasy Brave Exvius, players squared off against another amalgamation of previous final bosses called Chaotic Darkness. Its name pulled from the recurring chaos element and the notion of darkness, something that was quite literal in terms of the naming in Final Fantasy III. But beyond that, its existence was reminiscent of earlier games too, as it was formed as a result of the cumulative evil found in the hearts of humans over the course of history. In the initial sense, there was a slight variation, as the chaotic darkness was not a being as such, instead it was a weird mass, but after being unsuccessfully wielded as a weapon by Sol, the chaotic darkness would transform into an otherworldly being. It would then fall upon the party to defeat the chaotic darkness to stop it from indiscriminately obliterating the world. During the encounter itself, players would find a somewhat regressive final boss, at least compared to what had come before, as even though its lore was aligned, its ability set was reduced with no noticeable callbacks and the encounter itself only consisted of one phase. Shinryu appeared in both the original Dissidia and its sequel Dissidia Duodecim. Both times Shinryu was a summonable ally, but in Duodecim, a variant called Shinryu Verus also appeared wielded by an evil force, and this was somewhat foreboding as in Dissidia NT, Shinryu would serve as the main antagonist and final boss. Such was the threat posed by Shinryu that both the champions of Materia and Spiritus agreed to work together in order to try and bring about its demise, and the fight itself would prove quite troublesome. Harkening back to the original final boss, Chaos, Shinryu would use a variety of elemental attacks, and after its health was whittled down, it would then enter into a second phase. During this phase, Shinryu could use enhanced elemental attacks, each of which was tied back to the various other summonable beasts present in Dissidia NT. As the story of World of Final Fantasy built to a close, what players got to witness was something both unexpected, but also expected. From a narrative perspective, things would end up getting pretty wild, and there would be some definite surprises, but from a mechanical perspective, the final boss, X9 Bahamut, would fulfil many, many traits associated with previous final bosses. First, it would continue the trend of Bahamut being associated with the final boss, with perhaps it being the most literal manifestation of that particular trait as Brandelis was a Bahamut. After defeating a gauntlet of previous bosses, the players would then face X9 Bahamut for the first time, but in typical style, even though the encounter was tough, it would not be the final encounter. Instead, X9 Bahamut would transform into a much more fantastical version of its former self. During the encounter, X9 Bahamut would have access to a wide array of abilities, with Mega Fela Cannon appearing as a recurring ability for both Bahamut and some previous final bosses. X9 Bahamut would also have an intriguing mechanic, as unlike some previous bosses where phases would be used to increase difficulty of the encounter, for this particular fight, X9 Bahamut's agility would consistently increase as its HP decreased. This meant it would get faster and faster turns, making the fight quite troublesome to manage in its final stages. I'm afraid you're out of luck. Even before Final Fantasy XV released, it was clear who the main antagonist would be, as Art of Nezunia was front and centre in terms of promotional materials, including Kingsglaive. However, even though that was the case, there was no guarantee that Arden would still end up being the final boss, as so many times before, some greater power would emerge as the true villain. When looking at the wider Final Fantasy XV universe, 
that would end up being true, but within the base game Arden fulfilled every major antagonistic role, and what we saw from the final boss encounter would have some strong parallels with a few previous final bosses. Perhaps the most interesting element was that there would be no specific transformation, at least in the otherworldly sense. Much like Xu Yin, this meant the Arden we saw at the beginning was the Arden we saw at the end, and in many ways this would end up being quite unnerving, as that lovable Arden smarminess was still there even when he was fighting to the death. However, unlike the fight against Xu Yin, the final boss encounter against Arden still had distinct phases. During the initial phase, Arden would use basic attacks to mirror that of Noctis. This would see him able to use warp strikes and the royal arms, and quick time events were scattered throughout to add a sense of urgency. This would then give way to a second phase. During this phase, Arden would undergo a small transformation, as he would gain access to the armager, something that would be accompanied by a red glow. The final phase would then be slight by comparison. It would see Arden act more like a wounded animal, stumbling around seeming to pose no real challenge. However, he could still strike and deal incredible damage when catching the player by surprise. In this way, the final phase was much more there for ceremonial purposes than anything else, and it was quite representative of previous encounters against the likes of Fail Thanos and Genesis. Stormblood arrived as the second major expansion to Final Fantasy XIV, and its final boss was quite intriguing. Shinryu was introduced within Heavensward as a very powerful primal, and as the main scenario quest for Stormblood developed, the player would be forced to witness its power firsthand. After having its consciousness overtaken by Xenos, something that had now become a recurring theme for final bosses within Final Fantasy XIV, the player would end up fighting against Shinryu as part of the Royal Menagerie. Here, they would take part in a multi-phase encounter that had an inadvertent resurfacing of the elements often associated with chaos. It would see Shinryu use a multitude of high-tier elemental spells, however, Unlike Chaos, who used spells associated with the Four Elements having absorbed the power of the Four Fiends, Shinryu wielded the power of Six Elemental Primals. The other interesting trait of note was Shinryu's size. Even though many prior final bosses would undergo transformations to alter their form, they would seldom dwarf the player in size. Chaos within Dissidia Final Fantasy had served as an exception here, but Shinryu resurfaced this trait in a rather meaningful manner. As the fight progressed, the player would also be forced to adapt to a changing stage, with Shinryu using its size to break various parts. And there would also be an interesting first, as even though active time maneuvers had been seen with a few other Final Fantasy XIV boss encounters, this was the first time a quick time event was associated with a final boss. All things considered, by introducing new interpretations of older traits, and even bringing some new traits to the table, this all served to make the encounter against Shinryu pretty memorable. As was the case with Heaven's Ward, the finale of Stormblood's story would arrive in patch 4.3, and it would see the player square off against Sukuyomi, a primal of great power. And this presented a curious twist. Many previous final bosses associated with Final Fantasy XIV were known entities. Time had been taken to introduce them through various narrative means, and although in some instances there were some grand transformations, none really came out of left field. Tsukuyomi was different. Ahead of patch 4.3, this saw Square Enix make no mention of the boss, and information relating to Kashrim Fluminus, the trial in which Tsukuyomi would be encountered, was kept under wraps. And this was due to the relationship Tsukuyomi had with Yotsuyu, a known antagonist who had featured throughout Stormblood. Everything would then culminate in a big reveal, with Yotsuyu transforming into Tsukuyomi and challenging the player. The fight itself would have numerous distinct phases. The first phase would be against Tsukuyomi, with the second taking place within Yotsuyu's consciousness, having gained control of her mind. This would then give way to one of the most unique aspects of the fight, Selenomancy. Over the years, numerous boss fights would force players to be aware of their surroundings, with Shinryu even removing parts of the stage, but with Selenomancy, Tsukuyomi would split the stage in half, penalising players for spending too long within each half. This would see the encounter end on a high note from a gameplay perspective, with that sentiment carrying over to the narrative upon its conclusion. The third major expansion to Final Fantasy XIV, dubbed Shadowbringers, would feature an incredibly memorable final boss, Hades, aka Emmet Selk. 
Unbeknownst to the player, Emmet Selk had been manipulating events for many, many years, even acting as a pseudo-friendly companion like Elgo in Final Fantasy Dimensions. But as had been true for many prior Final Fantasy XIV final bosses, everything would culminate in one big epic showdown, as opposed to there being introductory battles beforehand. This epic showdown would take place within a trial known as the Dying Gasp. With Emmet Selk transforming into the demonic Hades, players would take part in an encounter that put their abilities to the test. It would utilise elements from the many final boss encounters seen within Final Fantasy XIV before, including transformations, multiple phases, the summoning of allies, instant fail states, stage changes, plenty of abilities designed to keep players on their toes, and even the notion of scale. And this would dwarf Shinryu, as during Hades' third phase, it would transform into its true self. And instead of just appearing outside of the stage, this meant Hades was almost all-encompassing, wrapping its appendages around the sides. With this fight also including an active time manoeuvre that would see a full party wipe occur even if just one player failed, and a generous checkpoint system, something seen before with Orphan in Final Fantasy XIII, it meant this fight definitely lived up to the billing and would live long in the memory. With Shadowbringers patch 5.3, dubbed Reflections in Crystals, players would then bear witness to the conclusion of the Shadowbringers story. This would see the player square off against the Warrior of Light or Elidibus, the final Arsian. However, even though the fight itself would be potent due to the symbolism and preamble, from a mechanical perspective it was quite derivative. In order to up the ante, Elidibus would absorb the body of Ardbert to become the Warrior of Light. But even though the source was quite unique, this particular device had been used numerous times throughout the franchise, and in particular Final Fantasy XIV. The fight itself would also revert to a simpler form, but there would be one intriguing aspect. The encounter would feature two distinct phases, much like some of the earlier Final Fantasy XIV boss fights, but there would be an active time maneuver placed in between that could result in a full party wipe. The intriguing element was that the Warrior of Light would be able to use the party's own limit breaks against them, something not seen before in a final boss encounter, as they would usually rely on their own unique abilities to deal damage. When the Final Fantasy VII Remake was announced, most players who were familiar with the original had a pretty strong feeling that Sephiroth would return as the final boss of the overarching story, as, well, that's what happened in the original game. But with the experience split into multiple parts, there was much less certainty around who would appear as the final boss of Remake, and when it turned out to be Sephiroth, it caught a lot of people by surprise. Sephiroth would appear at the conclusion of the multi-stage boss encounter against the Whisper Harbinger, but as a continuation of a more recent trend, and perhaps because the Whisper Harbinger had been so fantastical, as well as the developers wanting to ensure there was room for growth within future parts, Sephiroth would just appear in his regular human form. The encounter would be far from basic, however. Split into four distinct phases, the initial phase would represent a first for a final boss encounter. Perhaps to juxtapose the final encounter of Final Fantasy VII, it would see the party stripped away, and Cloud would need to square off against Sephiroth by himself. Upon the completion of this phase, Cloud would then be joined by another party member, and this resurfaced a trait not seen for many, many years in relation to a final boss party selection. For a while, it was believed that who joined Cloud in battle for the second and third phases was random, much like it was in Final Fantasy VIII. However, it's now known that it's dependent on the specific actions taken in the previous encounter against the Whisper Harbinger. This elevated the notion beyond the specific selection role players had in Final Fantasy VI and VII, as even though the player still had choice, and it would align with player preference, it was now much more dynamic. Throughout the first three phases, Sephiroth would use a plethora of powerful abilities to try and defeat the party. Many had become prominent parts of the Sephiroth toolkit over the years, such as Octoslash, Hell's Gate and Shadow Flare, with Heartless Angel also returning. But in the final phase, there was an interesting twist. Countdown timers associated with big moves were not a new mechanic, but Divine Proclamation added a degree of jeopardy rarely seen before. Much like Orphan in Final Fantasy XIII, who used Doom to provide a defined endpoint for the fight on its own terms, Divine Proclamation would also see a conclusion to the fight in Sephiroth's favour if he was not defeated before the countdown timer ended. <laughs> 
Endwalker has served as the most recent expansion for Final Fantasy XIV, and the narrative roots of its final boss brought back a trait often seen within the earlier days of the franchise. Throughout the expansion, the antagonists would vary, but as the story drew to its conclusion, Meteon would be revealed as the main antagonist, merging with her sisters to create the Endsinger, an entity who wanted to end all life. This would be reminiscent of beings such as Kefka and Necron, but the method would be quite unique, as the Endsinger wanted to end life by singing. Following the transformation, due to the sheer size of the Endsinger, players would be again fighting an enemy who was not part of the stage itself, something that had now become the norm with Final Fantasy XIV's final bosses. The fight itself would also be quite intense, with many, many mechanics fighting for the player's attention. This would include objects colliding with each other, some as that shot projectiles, and others that created growing pools that needed to be avoided. To make things more complicated, it would also be possible to fall off the stage, and after the initial phase was finished, a mechanic used within the Final Fantasy VII Remake would return, albeit in a slightly different form. It would see the Endsinger summon Kakademon while charging its despair gauge. If the Kakademon was not defeated before the gauge filled, the player would witness a game over and it would be similar to Sephiroth, as if he was not defeated before his countdown ended, the player would also lose. The fight would also go full circle with Final Fantasy XIV's final bosses, as part way through the encounter, the Endsinger would use ultimate fate, causing the player to lose. But it would be a fake out, as the player would be brought back, willed on by the Scions, and receiving the Prayer of Hope buff. This would not only be reminiscent of many previous final boss encounters in the franchise as a whole, but also the revised version of the fight against La Habrea within A Realm Reborn. It meant that the Endsinger would be composed of a mixture of recurring traits associated with Final Fantasy XIV's previous final bosses, as well as some intriguing traits from the wider franchise. But it will certainly be interesting to see what ends up happening as the story of Endwalker reaches its conclusion later on this year. With Stranger of Paradise Final Fantasy Origin having a direct connection with the original Final Fantasy, many players expected everything to come full circle, and this notion extended to the final boss encounter. This feeling became even more pronounced every time Jack mentioned the word chaos, but the surprise was that chaos was not the final boss, at least not by name. Instead, players squared off against Darkness Manifest, who was essentially an exact visual replica of the original chaos. The fight itself would be a pretty standard affair, at least in comparison to many previous final boss encounters. This would see the encounter split into two distinct phases, with each offering a distinct challenge. However, unlike the previous boss encounters in Stranger of Paradise, where the second phase would see the difficulty really ramp up, against Darkness Manifest, this wasn't quite the case. And this also represented an evolution, as instead of the final boss getting stronger or weaker, it was the player character who got stronger. By gaining dark aura powers, this meant for the second phase, Jack's break gauge would never go down, nor would Jack's mana. The knock-on effect of this would mean the use of abilities with no cost, unlimited use of soul burst without any fear of getting broken, and blocking with no consequence. Darkness Manifest would adapt its moveset to try and accommodate, but due to these power-ups, the second phase was more so different than more difficult. That the final boss of Stranger of Paradise flipped the switch in such a manner was rather fitting, especially given the nature of the game, and it further demonstrated that unlike some other evolutionary topics, which showed evidence of stagnation as the topic continued to develop and expand, this has not been the case with final bosses. Given that the element of surprise is one of the core tenets of the final boss, that can't be too surprising, but what's been evidenced, especially within the past 5-10 to 10 years, is that even though there's still plenty of traits being carried through, the developers are still finding new ways to evolve the final boss encounter, which, after this many games and this many final bosses, has to be commended. And this just makes us all the more excited to check out Final Fantasy XVI, to see how Hiroshi Takai, Kazutoya Maihiro, and Naoki Yoshida will attempt to surprise players yet again, hopefully creating an epic final showdown that will be remembered for decades to come. And with that, we're at the end of this particular evolutionary study. It's been by far the longest study we've produced to date, and we'd like to thank our Patreon supporters for suggesting we cover this topic. Now we don't often talk about this, 
but compiling this video and making it into something that was coherent involved hours upon hours of research, writing, recording, re-recording, and editing between myself and Vlad, the video editor who works with me, to make sure that Evolution's videos are as good as they can be. We therefore hope it has delivered on your expectations. If you would like to support the channel to ensure we can continue to create long-form content like this, then we encourage you to pledge on Patreon. There are numerous tiers available with the Warrior of Light tier offering voting rights. And this is something that is crucial for helping to influence the content we create each month. You can find out more by visiting patreon.com forward slash ffunion or by clicking on the link in the description below. We would also love to hear in the comments which game you feel features the perfect final boss. And of course, if you enjoyed this video, please consider giving us a like. Alright everyone, with that, this is Daryl signing out. I'd like to extend a big thank you to all of our Patreon and YouTube membership supporters, especially Benjamin Snow, Chris M. Walker, The Livestream, Elsa, Claire Farron, Galsian D. Kujata, Gregory, Justin Dent, Lord of Mourning, and Zukan TDK, who are super special Onionite supporters. And of course, a big thank you to everyone for watching this video. I'll see you all again soon for more Final Fantasy goodness.